Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, or good night, whenever it is that you are watching or listening to this. How was everyone's weekend? It is Monday when I am filming this, so, you know, our usual little chats. I miss them, and I miss you guys. Um, so I was just looking at our Fable Haven book right here, and we only have this much left of our book you guys it's all wrapping up and it's getting so exciting um yeah so are you ready to continue okay so we are on chapter 18 the old manor do you remember why they're going to the old manor so Patton took an artifact from lost mesa and hid it in fable haven at the old manor and it only appears every Monday for one hour so it's Monday huh it's Monday and they are going after it but they have to go to the old manor and there's something there we're not sure what but there's something so we are going to find out some things are you ready I don't think you're ready are you ready okay Alone, Kendra leaned against the smooth gazebo railing, watching dozens of creatures take up positions around the field. Dryads and hamadryads clustered around indentations where the hedge was penetrable. Doran led a band of satyrs to the main gap by the path. Groups of fairies patrolled the air in glittering formations. Broadhoof and Cloudwing took up positions in the center of the field near Hugo in the cart. Not all of the creatures were participating. The majority of the fairies flitted about the trellises of the boardwalk playing among the blossoms. The dwarfs had unanimously taken refuge in their tents, having complained to Grandpa that running was not their strong suit. The more animal-like creatures had gone into hiding. Many satyrs and nymphs observed the proceedings from other gazebos. Even in the shade, the midday heat was uncomfortable. Kendra limply fanned herself with one hand. She could not see Seth, Grandma, Warren, or Dale. They had collapsed a tent and lay hidden beneath it in the bed of the cart. Grandpa stood at the front of the cart, supervising the final preparations, hands on his hips. Kendra had kept her word and refrained from telling anyone about Seth's agreement with Broadhoof. Grandma and Grandpa had been overjoyed to hear that the centaurs would assist with the diversion. Kendra had done her best to appear equally pleased. Grandpa raised a handkerchief in the air, waved it briefly, and then let it fall. As the silky square fluttered to the ground, Cloudwing reared, equine muscles churning beneath his silver fur. He clutched a huge bow in one hand, and across his broad back hung a quiver of arrows the size of javelins. Broadhoof unsheathed his tremendous sword with a flourish, the burnished blade catching the sunlight. Together, the centaurs raced across the grass toward the gap in the hedge, blurred hooves flinging up tufts of turf, galloping with such fluid speed that Kendra found herself breathless. Shoulder to shoulder, they charged through the gap, stampeding over the dark satyrs who sought to impede their passage. With a victorious shout, twenty satyrs detached themselves from the hedge at either side of the gap and followed the centaurs through, spreading out in all directions. A few hamadryads ran with them. While the satyrs were quick and nimble, the nymphs put them to shame, seeming more to fly than to run, effortlessly outdistancing any pursuers. Kendra smiled to herself. No smitten satyr would ever chase down a hamadryad who did not wish to be caught. Around the field, dryads and satyrs snuck through hidden openings in the hedge, often on hands and knees. Fairies flew over the hedge wall, angling skyward as their shadowy sisters gave chase. The satyrs watching from the boardwalk whistled, stamped, and shouted huzzas. Many naiads surfaced, heads dripping, eyes wide as they observed the tumult. Amid the commotion, Hugo charged forward, towing the cart. Grandpa had hidden himself under the tent with the others. Kendra held her breath as the hulking golems stormed through the gap in the hedge, unmolested, and the cart rumbled out of sight. After the cart passed through the main gap, a few tall dryads followed, splitting off in different directions, their flowing robes and long hair trailing behind. Satyrs and hamadryads began returning under the hedge and through the gap. Some laughed, others appeared flustered. Kendra glanced back at the naiads, their weedy hair glossed with slime, their wet faces surprisingly fragile and young for beings whose favorite pastime was drowning humans. Kendra locked eyes with one of them and waved. In response, they all hastily plunged under the water. Over the next several minutes, more fairies, satyrs, and dryads returned. As they re-entered the field, they were welcomed by embraces from friends. 
Most then turned to anxiously await the arrival of other loved ones. More minutes passed and arrivals grew sparse. Running hard, flanks lathered, the centaurs galloped through the gap, forcing a cluster of dark fairies to abandon their pursuit. Only two arrows remained in Cloudwing's quiver. Less than a minute later, dodging and fighting several dark satyrs, Doran reappeared in the gap, leading a desperate knot of satyrs. Shoving opponents aside, a half-dozen satyrs stumbled through the gap into the arms of friends. Kendra saw a familiar figure standing at the threshold of the field. Verl, snowy fur matted with dirt, chest and shoulders marred by bites and scratches, strained to take a step forward. He had won through to the field, but his eyes widened with panic as an unseen barrier prevented his entry. Kendra saw his childish face begin to contort into a more goat-like countenance, watched his white fur begin to darken. Bleating black satyrs hauled him down from behind, piling on him. Moments later, where, when Verl arose, he had the head of a goat and fur as black as sable. The satyrs and hamadryads withdrew from the gap. Kendra descended the gazebo steps and ran to Doran. Did they get away all right? The satyr panted. Yes, Kendra said. How awful about Verl. Nasty business, Doran agreed. At least most of us made it back. The worst trouble came after a flock of dark fairies cornered one of the most powerful dryads. They changed her swiftly, and she went on to nab a bunch of us. I see the centaurs made it back. He nodded toward where Broadhoof and Cloudwing stood ringed by animated satyrs, grimly enduring the adulation. They were fast, Kendra said. Doran nodded as he tried to wipe mud from his collarbone. They can run, and they can fight. Cloudwing pinned a pair of dark satyrs to a tree with a single arrow. Broadhoof hurled the dark dryad into a ditch. Toward the end, a dark centaur showed up and forced them to retreat. Broadhoof and Cloudwing trotted away from their admirers. Kendra gazed despairingly at the heavily muscled topography of Broadhoof's back. If Seth survived the escapade at the manor, the brawny centaur would be waiting. Kendra wondered whether her brother might be better off as a shadow. Do you remember that in order to get the centaurs to agree to help with the diversion. Seth had to, um, well, he challenged Broadhoof to a duel because he insulted him. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. Dragonflies. Beneath the tent, with four other bodies, Seth breathed hot, stale air. He closed his eyes and tried to focus on something other than his discomfort, imagining how refreshing it would feel to poke his head out and feel the wind rushing by as Hugo loped down the road. The day was hot and muggy, but nothing compared to the stifling atmosphere under the tent. The morning had felt surreal for Seth, watching goats and deer roaming about the field, and groundhogs congregating in their camp by the pond. Grandpa had spent a good deal of time going over plans with a pair of horses, and issuing commands to a strangely mobile pile of rocks. Kendra had pointed out which goat was Doran, and had served as translator when they wished each other good luck. All Seth heard was baaing and bleeding. The entire scene around the pond looked so ridiculous that Seth had briefly wondered whether the milk simply made everyone crazy. But when the rock pile lifted him off his feet and gently set him in the cart, it was plain there was much more going on than his eyes could distinguish. The cart jounced sharply and Seth wrapped his head against the side. Cradling his cranium, he wormed toward the center of the crowded cart, then rested his head and folded on his folded arms, trying to relax as he inhaled the warm, stifling air. For the first leg of the cart ride, he had been anxious, aware that dark creatures could fall upon them at any moment, but as the journey progressed, interference seemed less likely. The plan was apparently working. All they had to do was reach the manor without suffocating. The uncomfortable tedium of the ride became Seth's chief concern. Lying virtually motionless, his body slick with sweat, he pictured his face over a vent of an air conditioner, the coolness washing over him. He imagined himself gulping down a tall glass of ice water, the glass so cold it hurt his hands, the water so frigid it made his teeth tingle. He was stretched out beside Warren and wanted to make conversation, or at least exchange a few whispered complaints, but he had been strictly admonished not to utter a word. He resolutely followed orders, holding still and keeping silent, even choking back coughs when the urge arose. Meanwhile, the cart rolled endlessly forward. Seth slipped a hand into his pocket, fingering the dollop of walrus butter wrapped in plastic film. They each had a little in case the time arrived when seeing magical creatures became preferable to deliberate blindness. He wished he could eat it simply for a sensation to divert his mind from his unfortunate surroundings. Why hadn't he brought candy? 
or water. He lamented to think of his precious emergency kit sitting under his bed. How had he forgotten to bring it when he had gone down the trap staircase? He had jelly beans in there! The ride became more jarring, as if Hugo were dragging the cart over a giant washboard. Seth clenched his jaw to prevent his teeth from clacking. The stuttering vibrations made it difficult to think. At last, the cart came to an abrupt stop. Seth heard rustling as Grandpa peeked out. We're at the edge of the yard, Grandpa announced quietly. As I feared, Hugo can go no further. Out we go. I see no present threat. Seth gratefully crawled out from under the tent, feeling validated that the others were at least as red-faced and drenched in sweat as he was. His clothing felt clingy and sticky, and although the air was not as fresh as he had hoped, it was still much preferable to the stuffiness in the cart. Behind the cart stretched a weathered flagstone road flanked by the remnants of old cabins and shacks. Many of the flagstones were out of place, and tall weeds throve in the gaps. The uneven stone road explained the washboard feeling at the end of the ride. Seth had walked that road before. He should have guessed. Ahead of them, the road doubled back on itself to form a looping driveway that granted access to an impressive manor. Compared to the time-worn road and the decrepit shelters bordering it, the manor was in excellent repair. The building rose three stories with four stately pillars out front. Climbing plants had invaded the gray walls and heavy green shutters shielded the windows. Seth gaped at the manor, taking in a ghastly difference since his previous visit. Now, hundreds of slender black cords converged on the mansion from all directions, entering through the walls, a few of them fairly thick, most slender and hard to see. The shadowy cords snaked away from the estate in all directions, many disappearing into the ground, some winding through the surrounding vegetation. What's with all the wires? Seth asked. Wires? Grandpa questioned. Ropes, strings, whatever, Seth clarified. They're everywhere. The others regarded him with concern. You don't see them? Seth already knew the response. No wires, Warren confirmed. I've noticed cords like this before, Seth said, connected to the dark creatures. It looks like all the cords lead to the manor. Grandpa puckered his lips and exhaled noisily. We've uncovered hints that the culprit was a creature who had somehow merged with Curasoc, and we had information that the apparition who haunts this property has some relation to the demon. What could the creature be? Warren asked. Anything, Grandpa said. When it merged with Curasoc, it became a new entity. But if it merged with the demon, how can it be here? Dale asked. Curasoc must remain in his domain. Grandpa shrugged. Best guess? Some sort of distant connection. Something like the dark cords that apparently unite the monster in the manor to the darkened creatures all over the preserve. Do we still go after the artifact? Warren asked. I see no alternative, Grandpa said. Fablehaven may not survive another week. This could be our only shot. Besides, we can't plan to defeat whatever dwells here until we confirm what it is. I agree, Grandma said. Dale and Warren nodded. Grandpa glanced at his wristwatch. We'd better get moving or the opportunity will pass us by. Leaving Hugo behind, Grandpa led them to the front steps of the manor. Seth remained on high alert, watching for suspicious animals, but saw no signs of life. No birds, no squirrels, no insects. Quiet, Dale murmured suspiciously. Grandpa raised his hand and twirled a finger, suggesting they do a lap around the manor. So near the building, Seth could not avoid touching some of the dark cords. He was relieved to find them as intangible as a shadow. As they progressed, Seth stayed ready for an attack at any instant, especially as they rounded each new corner. But they finished a complete circuit around the manor without encountering any interference. They identified a few windows low enough to grant them access, as well as a back door. Last time, the front door was unlocked, Grandpa whispered to Seth. Yes. Ruth and I will enter through the front, Grandpa said. Warren will take the back door. Dale, choose a side window. Seth, you wait outside. Should we fail, unless there is a monumentally compelling reason to do otherwise, return immediately to Hugo and take word to your sister and the other creatures. If we become shadows ourselves, we'll try to contact you. Remember, everyone, we want the northernmost room on the third floor. He gestured to show which was the northern side of the manor, probably at the end of the hall. The combination is 332231. He checked his wristwatch. We have about seven minutes. <clears throat> What's the go signal? Warren asked. 
I'll whistle, Grandpa said, raising a pair of fingers to his lips. Let's get this over with, Dale said. Warren and Dale jogged around the manor out of sight while Grandpa and Grandma mounted the steps. Grandpa tried the front door, found it unlocked, and stepped back, eyes on his watch. Seth's hands were clenched into such tight fists that when he uncurled his fingers, he found that his nails had printed tiny crescents in his palms. Eyes on his wristwatch, Grandpa slowly raised his finger to his lips. A piercing whistle shattered the silence. Clutching her crossbow in one hand and flash powder in the other, Grandma followed Grandpa through the front door. Grandpa closed the door behind them. From the side of the house, Seth heard wood splintering and glass breaking. He figured it was Dale gaining access through a window. Silence returned. Seth flexed his fingers and tapped his toes. He could feel his heart beating in his hands. Staring at the quiet house was torture. He needed to see what was happening inside. How could he judge whether there was a monumentally compelling reason to enter and help if he didn't know what was going on? Seth climbed the steps to the front porch, nudged the front door open, and peered through the resulting crack. The house was much as he remembered, well furnished but heavily powdered with dust and festooned with cobwebs. Grandma and Grandpa stood frozen at the foot of a sweeping staircase. At the top of the stairs, dust swirled in a vortex from floor to ceiling. All of the wires and cords of varying thickness converged on the whirlwind in a clot of shadow vaguely shaped like a human figure. Seth took a step through the doorway. The air felt severely chilled. His breath plumed white in front of him. Grandma's hand with the crossbow trembled as if she were striving to lift it under tremendous duress. The spinning column of dust glided down the stairs. Seth's petrified grandparents made no move to get out of the way. Although he did not experience the same paralyzing terror that gripped Grandma and Grandpa, the cold was real and the sight horrifying. If he failed to act, his grandparents were doomed. The black hub of the shadow plague was bearing down on them. He pulled the walrus butter from his pocket, tore the plastic, smeared a fingertip in the paste, and stuck the finger into his mouth. As he swallowed, the scene resolved itself more clearly. The pillar of dust vanished, replaced by a spectral woman swathed in flowing black garments. Her bare feet hovering several inches above the stairs. Do you know who it is? We've seen her before in our stories. Seth recognized her. She was the same apparition who had appeared outside the attic window on Midsummer Eve the previous year. She had fought alongside Muriel and Bahumat in the battle at the Forgotten Chapel. All of the dark threads converged on her. Her clothes and skin were drenched in shadow. Her eyes were black voids. Undulating ribbons of material stretched from the apparition toward, her gran toward his grandparents, moving as if coaxed by a slow breeze. Grandpa! Grandma! Seth yelled. They did not budge. Stan! Ruth! Run! Seth screamed the words, his voice cracking. Neither of his grandparents flinched. The apparition paused. Her soulless pits gazed at Seth for a heartbeat. Seth ran toward his grandparents, moving quicker than the fabric, but with more ground to cover. The tendrils of black fabric arrived first, seizing Grandpa and Grandma Sorensen like tentacles. Seth skidded to a stop, staring in shock as shadow overcame them. Seth turned and ran out of the front door. His grandparents were shadows. He had to hurry. Maybe he could still rescue Dale or Warren. While racing around the house, Seth struggled to convince himself that he would find a way to restore his grandparents to normal, and Tanu, and Coulter. He wondered how much time remained before the safe was scheduled to appear. Even if everyone else failed, he had to make it to that upper room and claim the artifact. It was apparent which window Dale had entered, courtesy of the unhinged shutters and broken glass. With a hop, Seth grabbed the windowsill and boosted himself up. Dale stood in a dusty parlor, unmoving his back to the window. Dale, back up, Seth hissed. You have to get out. Dale gave no indication of having heard the warning. He did not twitch. Beyond him, through a doorway, Seth saw the apparition gliding in their direction. Seth dropped from the window and dashed to the back of the house. Maybe while the shadow lady claimed Dale, he could bolt up the stairs. He flung open the back door and found Warren sprawled on the far side of the kitchen floor, positioned as if he had been trying to crawl forward. How long would it take to lug Warren outside? Would the time spent dragging Warren cause him to miss his window of opportunity for slipping up the stairs? Maybe, but he couldn't just leave him there. Crouching, Seth looped his arms under Warren's and began hauling the larger man backward across the tile floor toward the door. Seth, Warren breathed. 
You with me? Seth asked, surprised. Warren tucked his feet beneath himself, and Seth helped him stand. So cold, like the grove, Warren mumbled. We have to hurry, Seth exclaimed. He started across the kitchen, but Warren did not follow. Once again, he appeared paralyzed. Seth returned to Warren and grabbed his hands. Life rekindled in his eyes. Your touch, Warren murmured. Run, Seth said, leading his friend by the hand through the house toward the entry hall. Staggering along with stilted strides, Warren managed a respectable pace. They reached the bottom of the stairs and started up. Breathing hard, Warren stumbled, fighting his way up the steps with his free arm and both legs. Seth tried his best to pull the struggling man forward. Glancing down the steps, Seth saw the shadowy apparition return to the entry hall. Garments unfurling and billowing with dreamlike slowness, she drifted toward them, levitating forward and upward. Seth and Warren reached the second-story hall, passing a photograph of Patton and Lena hanging on the wall. Seth held Warren with both hands. The added contact seemed to invigorate him. Shambling forward, they arrived at the foot of a staircase to the third level, just as the spectral woman reached the second floor and came floating down the hall. They were most of the way up the stairs when Warren stumbled badly. Seth lost his grip and Warren tumbled down several steps, coming to rest in a motionless heap. Seth leaped down to him, clasping one of Warren's hands in both of his. Warren stared at him, pupils unevenly dilated, blood trickling from the corner of his lips. Go, Warren mouthed. He dug a hand into a pouch at his waist, pulling out a fistful of flash powder. The shadowy apparition appeared at the base of the stairs, dragging her numberless dark wires. Warren flung the powder at her. There was no crackle or flash. Her fluttering garments flowed toward them. Seth released his friend and charged up the stairs two at a time. If he failed to claim the artifact, all these sacrifices would be in vain. He dashed down the third-story corridor to the north end of the manor, relieved at how fast he could run without towing Warren. His eyes fixed on the door at the end of the hall. His legs and arms pumped hard until he rammed the door with his shoulder, clawing at the knob. It was locked. Seth stepped back and kicked the door. It shuddered but did not open. The shock of the impact hurt his shin. He kicked the door a second time to no avail. Taking a few steps back, he crouched and charged, shoulder lowered, transforming himself into a projectile, aiming not at the door but beyond it. Wood cracked and split, the door flew open, and Seth tumbled through to land on his hands and knees. Rising, he shut the splintered door as best he could. The room he had broken into was broad, with two shuttered windows. A huge oriental rug covered the hardwood floor. Bookshelves lined one wall. There were a couple of chairs in a sitting area beside a canopy bed. He saw no safe. Had they been correct to account for daylight saving time? Had the safe come and gone? Or was it yet to arrive? Perhaps the safe was currently there but hidden. Whatever the answer, Seth had only seconds before he joined the others as a shadow. He raced to the bookshelf, frantically scooping armfuls of volumes out of place, hoping to find a hidden safe in the wall. When that yielded no result, he turned, eyes darting around the room, and there it was, standing in a corner where it had not been a moment before, a heavy black safe, almost as tall as Seth, with a silver combination dial in the center. Bounding across the room to the safe, he began turning the dial. It rotated smoothly, unlike the dial on his locker, which was jerky and clicked a little when you reached the correct number. He spun the dial right twice to 33, left once to 22, then directly back to 31. When he pulled the handle, the door swung open silently. Here we go. A single object rested on the floor of the safe, a golden sphere approximately a foot in diameter, its polished surface interrupted by several dials and buttons. Seth could not imagine what the peculiar device did. And guess what? That's where I'm stopping today. I know, I know, I know, I'm so sorry, but we've got other things to do, friends. I hope you're good. I hope you you had a great weekend. I hope you go out and enjoy the sunshine. It looks like the next few days are going to be absolutely beautiful. So go and do something outside. And I miss you guys. I hope you're doing really well. And I will see you next time. Okay? Bye!